Thank you for joining us on Ask a Historian. I'm Matthew Wilkinson, historian with Heritage Mississauga. And each week we invite you to send in your stories, your questions, your things that you've been wondering about, what you might have seen on the landscape, old, old buildings, old cemeteries and the like, and we'll have fun exploring the history of the city of Mississauga with you. Thank you, Jim, for the question on the old First United Church building in Port Credit and its connections to the Indigenous Mississaugas. Um, I wish there was a clear answer, but uh, the, the um, um, like many things in history, the, the, the story is a little murky, but uh, there are some connections and we'll delve into them here. But uh, it's always fun to kind of step back in time and look at the stories of how things came to be uh, in, our, in our early communities. Um, the... Stepping back a little bit earlier than uh, the establishment of First Methodist Church uh, can will we'll kind of shed some light on the on the connections to the indigenous Mississaugas. Uh, the earliest establishment of Methodism in uh, what is now Mississauga took place when a chapel was created at the Credit Mission Village site in 1826 under the direction of Reverends Peter Jones and Egerton Ryerson. Uh, Egerton Ryerson, of course, better known for his connections to the public education system, but early in his career he was a, a Methodist minister under the direction of Reverend Peter Jones at the Credit Mission site. Um, and uh, there is some reference to this, this very early building as being a bark building building and, and others as a small log chapel, likely a log chapel perhaps sheathed in bark uh, is a better description of it, but uh, nonetheless in 1826 a, a small log building uh, created at the Credit Mission site as the first Methodist church, or in, not with a capital F if you will, uh, but just as a Methodist chapel at the Credit Mission site. Uh, the first service at this chapel was held on April 18th of 1826 and reference to that is found in the journals of Reverend Peter Jones. Um, in 1828, only uh, a short time later, a decision was made at the Credit Mission site that a, a larger church building was, was needed in the community. Money was raised in York, what is now Toronto, and the lumber was procured from Racy, the Racy Sawmill at Arendelle, just up the road and up the river, if you will, from uh, the Credit Mission site. Uh, the foundation for this building was laid at the end of October of 1828, and the church was built within six weeks. Uh, the first service at this new frame church uh, was uh, was held on November 20, uh, 25th of 1828. And much like the earlier church, uh, the first service was conducted by Reverend Peter Jones. Uh, the building also served as a schoolhouse and a meeting hall, and it also uh, uh, met the needs of both the indigenous and the, and the surrounding non-indigenous community. Um, they were both welcome at the Methodist Chapel at the Credit Mission site. Uh, and the Credit Mission itself, of course, where the Mississauga Gulfland Country Club is today. Um, it, the town plot for what would become the village of Port Credit was surveyed in 1835. So at that point, uh, Reverend Peter Jones and the Credit Mission are well established. And uh, to the south of them on the shores of Lake Ontario and the Credit River, a village plot is laid out. We know it today as the Old Port Credit Heritage Conservation District. That is south of Lakeshore Road between Mississauga Road and the Credit River and Lake Ontario. Um, and uh, in 1838, it was determined that this uh, this uh, young and growing village need a church of their own. Um, what is a little bit uncertain as to when that uh, church was first built. There are some references to 1838 as being a time when the community was rallying to build a church, although there's some suggestion that they didn't build it until 1845. Uh, there is a reference to the earliest service being held in 1845. Again, not entirely sure if that is accurate. So between 1838 and 1845, a church building is built in the village of Port Credit. It becomes known as First Methodist Church. Um, and uh, there is a connection between the building of this church and the Indigenous Mississaugas. And that gets back to your question, Jim. Um, the, uh, the Indigenous Mississaugas are, references of ha are referenced as having hauled the stone from the nearby Credit River for building the foundation of the church. Um, it, is, it is not clear whether that was the men of the community, the women of the community, or both the men and the women of the Credit Mission community. We don't have that uh, known for certain, but uh, it is referenced that the Indigenous Mississaugas hauled the stone and built the foundation for the new church. Um, and uh, the uh, one of the, the fascinating things about it is the first trustees for the first, uh, first Methodist Church in Port Credit 
Uh, there were five of them. There were three members from the uh, the Credit Mission Village uh, site and three Indigenous uh, trustees and two non-Indigenous trustees from the uh, the new village of Port Credit. Um, and uh, the the first me first uh, 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 service in the new church in Port Credit was uh, not conducted by Reverend Peter Jones, unlike the ones at the Credit Mission, but it was overseen by Reverend James Spencer. Um, in 1845, uh, likely when the, the church was relatively new, if not newly built at the time, the indigenous Mississaugas, uh, just before leaving the credit mission site uh, in 1847, they donated the chancel railing from their chapel at the credit mission to the new church in Port Credit. Uh, and that church in Port Credit served its community right up until 1893. Uh, that's when a decision was made that the community required a new church. Uh, this is Port Credit itself, required a larger building. And in 1894, the original First Methodist Church was sold and moved, becoming a community hall known as Shaw's Hall for a time. It wasn't moved very far away, only about uh, half a block away. Um, and in 1915, Shaw's Hall became the first Masonic Lodge or the Mississauga Masonic Lodge. Um, and the hall was uh, once again moved, although only a few feet this time. It was picked up, moved adjacent to its uh, site after, after 1894, put on a new foundation, renovated and enlarged. And that's the building we see today as the Mississauga Masonic Lodge. And that was, the renovations took place between 1916 and 1917 and it remains active as a Masonic Lodge to this day. And so that's the link back from, from that early building uh, to the, uh, the First Methodist Church in Port Credit and the assistance of the Indigenous Mississaugas in building that church. Uh, as for the new church, the new First uh, Masonic Lodge, uh, sorry, the, the new First Methodist Church, uh, the cornerstone was laid on May 8th of 1894, uh, and this served the community right up until 1950. Uh, in 1950, it was decided that another church, a larger church, was required, and this was built adjacent to and attached to the 1894 church. The, both of those churches, the 1894 church and the 1950 church, remain to this day. Although the congregation, uh, originally First Methodist, later First United Church, uh, they closed a few years ago and merged with uh, Christ Church in Clarkson. And so that congregation remains as a, as a, as a partner congregation with Christ Church over in Clarkson. But the buildings remain, although the 1894 church no longer has its, uh, its uh, a tower. It was removed in the 1950s, but uh, the church remains and remains active within the community to this day. Uh, and again, back to your question, the 1838 to 45 church remains. It stands nearby as the Mississauga Masonic Lodge. Uh, no trace remains of the original foundation. This building, that foundation would have been right on Lakeshore Road. And of course, the building's been moved a couple of times and sits on a new foundation to this day. So we, we do lose those connections to the indigenous Mississaugas from a physical perspective. Uh, and of course, they likely would not have known the 1894 church. The Mississaugas relocated in 1847. Um, but there is that connection to the early foundation of the Methodist Church, later the United Church, in Port Credit and back to the indigenous Mississaugas. So uh, again, thank you for the question, Jim, and uh, always fun to look at the origin stories of, uh, of buildings and communities and uh, kind of peel back the layers of time. So thank you. Thank you, Michelle, for your question on Mineola. And uh, Mineola is a, a place quite unique within our city and uh, different from the ways in which other subdivisions were built. We have uh, the large mature trees and the tree canopy largely surviving in the within the subdivision really makes it a different landscape. Uh, and for a time, Mineola was part of uh, Mississauga's cultural landscape inventory as well. That, that has changed in recent years. But it's uh, still a, a different place uh, within the city of Mississauga. Um, from the subdivision perspective, Mineola developed uh, really before it became standard practice to regrade topsoil and uh, you know, strip the land down and create a level uh, a building surface on which to work. Uh, the, the, the development of Mineola really 
worked within the natural topography that was there and, and, and saw it, whether directly or just indirectly from a, a beauty perspective. Uh, a lot of the mature trees were kept as Mineola was developed. Uh, Mineola came to be developed really in the kind of the 1930s to 1950s. That was the, the, the age of development in, in Mineola for the most part. Um, although that's now changing with kind of a second and third wave of development as, as things get replaced over time. Um, homes were nestled in, in uh, as they were built in Mineola, they were nestled into larger lots. Uh, natural drainage areas were maintained. Um, this provided a, a great opportunity for the, the you know saving existing trees. Uh, the soil was minimally impacted, and and so it did just a, a little different way of, of building subdivisions than we see to this day. Uh, roads whoa, were kind of also moved with their also were laid with the natural topography and line. Uh, they're, they're, they would rise and fall with the, with the, the way the land was. The houses would s sat at odd angles, some of them to the, the roadways themselves. Um, gradual influence, uh, gradual infilling to, uh, saw an increased density uh, into the 1950s and 1960s, uh, but uh, even up to the modern era for that, for that matter. But really a lot of effort has been taken to maintaining those kind of natural setbacks and uh, the natural tree canopy. Um, it's very interesting visually today to look at Mineola, of course, and that's uh, perhaps what has generated your, your question asking about the history of the community. Um, and uh, it's, it's, it's an excellent example, Mineola, of that uh, early subdivision type, although again, it's changing in the modern day in terms of new info that's taking place. But um, your question was more around history, and so let's jump back in time and kind of look at the early stages of, uh, of Mineola. Um, most of Mineola, or a large portion of it, is built on what was the Cotton family uh, farm, or Cotton family property. Uh, in 1837, uh, Robert Cotton emigrated from Ireland um, and settled in the Port Credit area. Uh, he was a well-known farmer and merchant, um, and uh, uh, land was purchased in the Port Credit area, and a, and a house was built in 1856, and that house survives as a private family home on Old River Road today. Uh, the and, and it is a designated home, but again a private home on the, on in the community. Robert Cotton passed away in 1885, uh, and before that time, he transferred the Cotton property to his brother James. Uh, James and Robert Cotton are often viewed as the fathers, or you know, kind of the, that first family of early Port Credit. Uh, James and Robert held various offices within Port Credit: uh, postmaster, storemaster, and owner of a wharf and a warehouse. Um, and the cotton farm itself remained in the family until it was sold by Cyril Cotton in 1943. So you go right from kind of the early 1840s up until 1943, uh, the cottons owned a large portion of what would become Mineola. Um, but they began to sell off property over time as well, and that's kind of where the, the story of the evolution of Mineola comes into play. Uh, we can really link the story to uh, the emergence of a, an individual by the name of Kenneth Skinner. Uh, and Skinner, along with his sons Victor and Milton, and you'll recognize those names on the landscape today, uh, there are roads named after Victor and Milton Skinner, uh, both of them builders working with their father. And Kenneth Skinner, uh, Kenali, is named after Kenneth and his wife. Um, and so there you have kind of the, that backbone of, of Mineola is connecting to the Skinner family. They purchased land from first from the George and Ellen Payne and then later from the Cottons. Uh, and they began to subdivide uh, property. Um, the uh, subdivisions uh, began early and they built uh, 38 houses in the community. A couple of them still survive um, and uh, began to sell off uh, portions of the property, uh, subdivide the property, if you will. And so Mineola has its connections, although in, in land back to the Cotton family, but really in kind of practical terms from building a community back to the Skinners themselves. Um, and you, you see they're, they're, they're the ones who laid out a good portion of the, the road escape through Mineola. Again, they built 38 houses and began to kind of create that subdivision, if you will, um, and uh, kind of blaze the path for what would Mineola would become in terms of protecting the tree canopy and larger lots and kind of the, the country living uh, perspective that we put into their development. And so they were active in the community really to between about 1910 and into the 1940s, uh, really setting the backbone for what would become uh, the community of Mineola. And so the between the Cottons and then the Paynes owned a, a portion of the land north of the Cotton Farm and then the Skinners coming in and buying portions of both, 
and leading the way to the subdivision that would become Mineola West. So hope that gives you a little bit of history and a taste where we can explore more uh, about Mineola in future episodes should we wish. But uh, thank you, Michelle, for your question and uh, truly a, a unique and uh, uh, interesting part of our city's fabric is Mineola West. Thank you, Ira, for your question on Ask a Historian, and uh, uh, one that I have uh, have a little bit of background with, and it was actually one of the first things I ever worked on about 20 years ago at uh, Heritage Mississauga, was an article revolving around the individual whose portrait appears on the utility box. Um, we have to say thanks to the Mississauga Arts Council. It uh, was their project that is uh, seen to the decoration of utility boxes around the city, and this is, is but one of them. The utility box that you're uh, referring to uh, is at the uh, southwest corner of Eglinton Avenue and Credit View Road, uh, and it uh, features a portrait of William Lyon Mackenzie. Uh, and your question about uh, who it is, uh, uh, William Lyon Mackenzie was a, a politician and a reform leader uh, in the 1820s through to the 1850s uh, in, uh, in Upper Canada, what is now Ontario, centered in Toronto for the most part. He actually had very little to do with Mississauga, but there is a reason why his portrait appears where it does, although it's a little bit of a long story, and it's a, one to, we'll have some fun with here, uh, walking down memory lane and uh, the, the roads of the past, if, if you will. Um, stepping back a little bit, uh, following the American Revolution, uh, which took place between 1775 and 1783, and also in the aftermath of the War of 1812, which lasted between 1812 and 1814, uh, an influx of, of non-Indigenous settlers uh, uh, came into, into Canada, largely what is Upper Canada or Ontario today. And in the early years immediately following the American Revolution, many, if not most, of these settlers were what we refer to today as United Empire Loyalists. They were refugees of the American Revolution. Um, in short order, though, the British Crown realized that they needed more people on the ground. They needed people to work the land. They needed farmers. Um, and uh, this attracted another wave of settlers in search of free land, and those being American-born settlers, uh, referred to by many as the late Loyalists in exchange for an oath of loyalty they would receive land uh, under under uh, British control under British rule um, they uh, these late loyalists often brought a, a mixed bag of allegiances of uh, ideas on on freedom and uh, and uh, coming up through the, the the roots of the American Revolution um, and the the seeds for discontent were really planted uh, at this uh, this time following the war of 1812 into the 1820s with this mix of nationalities of of uh, ideas of uh, the the concepts of, of what the land could bring to them or and what to what they could benefit from living here in Canada and it, it really became an area of discontent uh, among the rural population principally pushing back against the the ruling elite of the time which were loyalists but referred to kind of the wealthy elite of the society um, both economically and socially uh, and they were referred to as the family compact and this family compact tended to control most of the the public offices of the land um, and so this this really a divide between kind of uh, rural and urban populations or uh, at the time that uh, kind of set the seeds for political discontent through the 1820s and uh, kind of boiling over into the 1830s. Um, we, a lot of the grievances were around not only the family compact and the kind of unequal representation, but also uh, a double standard in terms of land speculation and uncleared and unimproved crown and clergy reserves and unopened road allowances and the like. And, and early settlers, early, early rural agri uh, agricultural settlers were finding the burden too much um, and began to agitate to reform. Uh, and they were drawn to the new reform party uh, that was, uh, was uh, running on a platform of uh, pushing back against this ruling uh, family elite, a family compact at the time, and enter into this mix uh, a, a fiery red-headed uh, Scotsman uh, by the name of William Lyon Mackenzie. He had a, a flair for argument and a passion for politics, uh, and he produced an independent newspaper which was known as the Colonial Advocate, 
um, and his uh, newspaper ran on the platform of agitate, agitate, agitate. So it tells you a little bit what his uh, beliefs were at the time. Um, and uh, it, it really was focused on raising the ire of the rural population against the family compact. Uh, in the beginning, at least with political aims of seeking to get reform members elected into the legislature, uh, himself included, William Lyon Mackenzie included in that. Um, and as the 1820s progressed, William Lyon Mackenzie openly attacked the family compact while continuing to support uh, popular forms of reform. Um, and uh, amongst his uh, those he courted would have been those that uh, lived within historic Mississauga, what was known as Toronto Township then. Um, Many had kind of romantic uh, concepts of uh, of revolution and republicanism, from, of course, from the United States and revolutions in France as well. And this kind of added to the general um, mixing pot, if you will, of, of, of discontent that was boiling. Um, and uh, it was almost impossible for uh, settlers within the home district in Peel County at the time, region of Peel was part of the home district, not to declare their uh, views, whether they were in support of Reform Party or the uh, the ruling Tories at the time. Uh, votes and sentiment were, were equally split, and any time politics came up, there there tended to be outbursts of anger and uh, um, uh, fisticuffs even in Streetsville. There's reported those those uh, things happening. Uh, William Lyon Mackenzie was elected the first mayor of Toronto in 1834, but uh, because of uh, cases of libel against him, he was dismissed shortly afterwards. Uh, the common belief that uh, elections were impartial, something we perhaps take uh, for granted today, was attacked uh, when Mackenzie was defeated in the elections of 1836. Uh, elections for in the home district for this area were held in Streetsville in 1836. Public accounts during those elections in Streetsville show that while Mackenzie was narrowly defeated, uh, the presence of, Shedri uh, of Sheriff Frederick Starr Jarvis, uh, who was standing beside the ballot box holding a whip and declaring that reformers were enemies, uh, openly influenced the vote, or at least likely did so. And, and also to vote at the time, you had to be uh, male of voting age, own land, and you had to rise on the hustings, that is walk up to a platform holding your voting card in the air and openly declaring in public who you voted for um, the presence of the Jarvis uh, of the sheriff Jarvis at the at the platform might have influenced people the way in which they announced their votes uh, certainly not the process we see today um, the uh, an exasperated Mackenzie uh, having been elected and defeated and elected and defeated and, and uh, been running on for some years under under this kind of uh, general dissatisfaction uh, they really boiled over in 1837, um, and uh, it was felt at the time by many, by Mackenzie and many of his followers, that the only option left was open rebellion. That was marching on the parliament and overthrowing the government at the time. We don't think of Canada in those terms, but it, it happened here and becomes known as the Rebellion of 1837. Uh, the rebels gathered on December 7th, 1837, uh, almost five miles north of Toronto, near where Young Street and Eglinton Avenue cross today, at a place known as Montgomery's Tavern. Uh, their goal was to march down Young Street and overthrow the, the government. Um, they didn't really count on a, an organized um, uh, opposition. There was uh, uh, uprisings going on elsewhere, and many of the uh, government troops had been sent to, to quell them uh, in Lower Canada, what is now uh, Quebec at the time. Um, through tactical errors, uh, in hindsight, poor planning and execution and very little training, the rebels that had gathered were quickly scattered by Colonel James Fitzgibbon and his militia um, and a handful of regulars at the time. Um, two rebels were, were killed in, in the exchange and two other rebels that were captured shortly thereafter were later, later hanged for high treason. Their names were Samuel Lount and Peter Matthews. In retaliation for the support of the rebels, Colonel Fitzgibbon uh, had Montgomery's Tavern burnt. Um, as the rebels escaped, they were uh, attempts were made to hunt them down. And Mackenzie was on the run at that point, and uh, and government troops were, were attempting to locate him. Um, one can imagine Mackenzie and you know some loyal followers uh, dashing away from the scene of the rout, desperately trying to outrun the the the, the government troops in hopes of of securing their own freedom. Um, 
their hastily uh, created plan was to uh, make for the United States and freedom. However, Toronto is a long way from the United States, whether you're on foot or on horseback, and the challenge was to get there without being captured. Uh, the rebels split up, some in groups of twos and threes, uh, others uh, 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 solitary, and others simply went home, melted back into the countryside. There was never kind of an official tally, although some were later uh, arrested for suspected involvement uh, at the time. News did travel slowly, although it did still travel. Um, so, you know, the news of the, the rebel route and the burning of the tavern was was uh, beginning to percolate, but in some cases the rebels were ahead of that news as they taught, as, uh, tried to escape. Uh, Mackenzie recounted his own uh, escape from uh, from this uh, attempt to capture him in, uh, in his book by his son-in-law, uh, Charles Lindsay. The book is called The Life and Times of William Lyon Mackenzie. Um, and uh, through that, we can trace his route because in a geographic sense, uh, his, route to fr his uh, route of escape took him through what is historic Mississauga, or what is, is Mississauga today. Um, we know that he f uh, f crossed uh, the Etobicoke Creek uh, up around uh, between Burnethorpe and Eglinton Avenue. Fleetwood Park area is where we believe he crossed. He came down to Dundas Street and on his very first night um, uh, escaping justice, he sheltered at Absalom Wilcox's house, which was near Dixie and Dundas in Historic Mississauga. And he recounts that in his book, how blankets were hung at the windows. Uh, and he was sheltered at the home of what he referred to as the Worthy Settler, which was a name given to Absalom Wilcox at the time. Incidentally, Absalom's son, Alan Wilcox, was one of the rebels that had gathered and was with Mackenzie on his flight. And Alan was part of this uh, journey uh, away from, uh, as a fugitive uh, away from those trying to capture them. Mackenzie and Allen did split up and make their way separately, but uh, presumably they were together when they reached Absalom Wilcox's house. Um, and uh, uh, many people in hindsight, many stories have come down about how they sheltered the rebels and sheltered Mackenzie. We can document through Mackenzie's own words uh, three places that he stayed on his flight through historic Mississauga and then beyond in Oakville and uh, Burlington and beyond as he's made his way down into Niagara. Ultimately, he did escape. He did make his way to the United States, but that's uh, another part of our story or getting away from where the uh, his face appears at the utility box. On uh, the uh, ra rising in the morning of uh, December 8th, um, 1837, at Absalom Wilcox's house, Mackenzie knows that the big obstacle in front of him is crossing the Credit River. Uh, there are only a handful of bridges. The bridges are bound to be guarded. Um, and indeed, the Dundas Street Bridge was guarded by the Arendelle Militia and their stories of, the, of them on the lookout for, for Mackenzie. So Mackenzie knows that he has to find friendly accommodation. He has to find a way to cross the river. And the knowing the terrain and having campaigned in this area, he knew some of the families. And by his own account, he made his way uh, to the concession road north of the Great Western Road. The Great Western Road is Dundas Street, and the concession road north of that was Burnhamthorpe Road. And so across Burnhamthorpe Road, and then he angled up uh, because he crossed the Credit River north of where Eglinton Avenue is today. There was a small bridge along Bar what is now Barberton Road on the Comfort property, and that is likely the, the most likely location that he crossed the Credit River because the second night he stayed at the Comfort's house, William Comfort in the south end of Streetsville. Um, and uh, the small crossing the Credit River was on the on the Comfort property. And so we know from Burnhamthorpe Road and one of the early uh, uh, traveled routes at the time, we know it today as Credit View Road. The original course of Credit View Road is uh, in portion uh, uh, Paravale Road and Rathkeel Road. That is the original route of, of Credit View. And it uh, uh, intersected with Eglinton Avenue, roughly where modern Credit View intersects with Eglinton Avenue. And so we know on uh, December 8th and the early hours of December 9th, Mackenzie crossed that point. It's one of the few places in our landscape we can say that the rebel leader did cross um, and made his way up to the Comfort property on the north side of Eglinton Avenue along the Credit River. And he stayed the night uh, of uh, December 8th into the morning of December 9th at the Comfort property south end of Streetsville.
Uh, and this is where Mackenzie probably comes closest to being caught. Um, uh, Comfort was a known rebel supporter, uh, a reform supporter, and uh, those that were on the other side of the ledger, if you will, decided to scout out some of their neighbors in case Mackenzie made his way, and it was believed that Mackenzie was spotted at William Comfort's house, and uh, a group of uh, um, conservative-minded uh, uh, loyalists uh, known as the Townline Blazers under the direction of Henry Cole uh, decided to, to um, uh, see what they could do about capturing Mackenzie. Uh, Comfort, uh, William Comfort, believing that he was being watched, uh, laid kind of a trap, if you will. Uh, two wagons left uh, uh, Mc uh, Comfort's house, one heading northward on what is Mississauga Road and one heading southward. Uh, Henry Cole and his group uh, decided to chase one uh, and uh, they uh, struck out northward uh, around after that wagon. Mackenzie was in the wagon going southward and so when they caught up with the one going north uh, they found out much to their disgruntlement it was William Comfort whom they arrested and sent to uh, the magistrate down in Arendale under his own recognizance to uh, kind of confess his crimes uh, if you will but Mackenzie had escaped at that point he was traveling southward on Mississauga Road um, and he reached uh, the Great Western Road or Dundas Street uh, at Mississauga Road um, or middle of the day of uh, December 9th. He, looking to his uh, east, he could see the militia were guarding the bridge over the Credit River, but he was already on the other side of it, and the militia, not realizing that, uh, saw no reason to uh, accost a wagon that was already on the other side. And Mackenzie uh, made his way uh, westward and beyond out of the reaches of militia, but again, probably the closest he came to being caught uh, as he tried to escape through uh, through Canada into the United States, and he did indeed make it to the United States. Um, sad story associated with this, uh, remembering the story of the Comfort family. William Comfort is sent to uh, sent to jail for uh, admitting to aiding the, the rebel uh, leader at the time, who of course had a bounty on his head. Uh, trying to exact information, those townline blazers under Harry Cole, um, they accosted uh, Sarah Comfort, William Comfort's wife, who was uh, uh, pregnant at the time with little children. They threw buckets of cold water on her. Remember that this is uh, December of 1837. Um, the really rough treatment of her and her children while William was incarcerated led to uh, a miscarriage and a premature death. Um, and uh, sadly, William was not allowed out of prison uh, to attend her funeral, and so she was buried uh, in a in an unmarked grave up in up in Streetsville. Uh, William I. Mackenzie, in his own recollections, uh, published again by his, his son-in-law uh, Charles Lindsay, but in his own recollections, that was really the only thing he lamented about uh, rising up in in uh, rebellion against the government was the, the the unfortunate passing of Mrs. Comfort, and again, that's a story that took place right here in historic Mississauga. Um, and again, Mackenzie did narrowly escape. Uh, he did find his way to the United States, uh, setting up a, a small attempted republic on Navy Island. That didn't last very long. That's a, another story. Um, but uh, he did end up back in uh, Upper Canada. Um, the, the rebels were pardoned, uh, by and large pardoned in 1841. Mackenzie does return. Um, and ultimately, the things that they had... Uh, fought for in uh, re the reform movement leading up to the rebellion and ultimately wanted to achieve during the rebellion, they were gained in peaceful measures, including what we take for granted today of responsible government and the secret ballot. Um, they were gained in the uh, in, in the 1840s through political reforms. Uh, Mackenzie did return to Upper Canada and was once again elected mayor of Toronto in the mid-1840s. Um, and it just shows that we don't think of ourselves as a place of uprising, but rebellions, a rebellion did happen here. Uh, really, a failed revolt, but a rebellion did happen here, and it shone a spotlight on on the uh, 
um, the challenges of, and the discontent that was happening here in the province, and they, that did lead to reform, uh, showing that the voice of the majority really cannot long be ignored. So that is the reason why you see the portrait of William Lyon Mackenzie, um, the rebel leader from the Rebellion of 1837, on that utility box as a, as a community art project uh, at the corner of Credit View and Eglinton Avenue. That intersection, that moment in time uh, in early December of 1837, when Mackenzie passed this point, uh, passed that point uh, on his way uh, as a flight from justice, um, a, a, uh, after an attempt to right the wrong of the political world at the time in, in Upper Canada, what is now Ontario. So uh, thank you very much for the question and uh, uh, happy sleuthing out there when you're looking around for tidbits of local history that might show on our landscape.